Welcome to Reader Syndicate 3.0, the next evolution of the look into counterculture that is canon. My name is Matthew, owner of Riot Seeds, and this started as a one-man mission for strain history and breeding science. Over time, it's evolved into something bigger, better, and more of a team effort. We will be joined by members of the Can Illuminati and other friends throughout the seasons to hear their takes on grow techniques, breeding science, strain history, and more. Our mission is to combat the narrative that corporate cannabis and seed posers are obfuscating for their own financial benefit. Welcome to the underground. We are the syndicate. So, yeah, I was, I was thinking of like where to go with this because you've done other shows before, but I think like briefly, not even briefly, like as, as much as you want to go into on your start, obviously, where your interest started how you got specifically into like a very niche area of like the land race heirloom older lines, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And we have questions from people in our discord and oh. I want to talk some of the lines obviously that you carry so it can shine some light on some of those too. Plus I'm interested in a lot of them and I have a bunch. So yeah. 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 Nice. Um, yeah. Uh, well, that's cool that people have sent in questions cause it's always good to sort of yeah. answer that for people. Cause often often i sort of don't realize the extent i mean i do i do because people mention it but you know when people come to the site and they're a bit overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of stuff on there and things like that yeah um but yeah i mean um for, for, for me it was uh something the, uh, the getting into this sort of niche as it were was more um the growing up in the uk in the 90s yeah um some of my well in fact all of my first encounters with cannabis were through uh stuff that friends of mine's parents had you know so sort of yeah. boomer generation people who would still in that era go and you know to nepal and places and bring back stuff to smoke and that kind of thing and then the people who I was talking to it about, talking to about it were also of that generation and would sort of regale me with anecdotes about smuggling hash back from Afghanistan and this type of thing, you know? So, so kind of triggered your interest. Um, yeah, I mean, that was my perspective on it was that that was the, the real cachet, the real kind of, um, you know, um, mythologized stuff was that old, old type of old school cannabis, you know, that was, anyway what i was kind of raised it, the, the context in which i grew up into cannabis was one in which that was always had the biggest sort of prestige attached to it you know sure. these were these old kind of like um hippie type characters you know like um it's probably a slightly i mean they definitely were back in the 60s but hmm. um that those you know they were doing the hippie trail and stuff and yeah and doing kind of scams like that and then and, as teenagers, we would occasionally like, you know, I'm talking kind of very early nineties and things would obviously being so close to Amsterdam in England anyway, yeah. you um, do, we were seeing that um, people were starting to, to grow, but it wasn't the indoor, indoor kind of domestic production in the UK didn't really take off in a big way until the late nineties, early two thousands and suddenly in the space of a couple of years, imported cannabis just disappeared from the UK completely. So most imports anyway, if you're in the UK, unless you knew someone, were pretty mm -hmm. fucking shit Moroccan hash, to be honest, throughout that era. <laughs> but if you didn't know someone, you could get, you know, nice Swazi red, sort of West African, oh, Nigerian, wow. and you could still get good, good Moroccan, and you'd see Lebanese, you'd see very seldom see like really good Afghan it, to, to get that. You'd need to go to Holland or someone somewhere to actually find someone who could get the real stuff. Cause most of what, most of the Afghan Pakistani type hash by that point that you'd see in the UK was bunk, even though people didn't seem to realize, you know, Yeah. but, um, but uh, anyway, so, uh, but if we did, if we did see like what we would call skunk and that kind of stuff in the early nineties, We'd sit, you know, I'd sit with my friends at, around at their house and stuff, and their parents would just be like, "Oh, this stuff's terrible. Why are you fucking touching mm -hmm. all crap?" You know, and they just 
give us this kind of lecture about how awful it is and stuff. And um, so that was kind of my perception anyway. And then also, you know, friends of mine who are Australians would basically have the same attitude. It's like if they came around and they saw, and these again, older generation, you know, if they saw us growing things, it'd be like, uh, these aren't pure sativas. You need like proper sativas. And they'd rave about Thai and Indonesian and Papua New Guinean sativas and stuff, you know. So always my perspective anyway was that. So for me, it was just that was the natural thing to be interested in. And when I did start trying to grow for myself i sort of had this realization fucking hell like i know where all these places are i want these seeds and i can see online that all these other people are wanting these seeds i know where to go to go yeah. and get them and um so it's just a kind of natural progression really it just um you know uh it all kind of fell into place um, yeah, that takes that takes yeah. connections like to to track down like legitimate stuff and, and you seem to be a, quite a well-read historian of cannabis and um yeah i can't imagine the links that you've had to go to 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 even to, to bring out a lot of this old stuff and a lot of the the land race stuff as well um i would say it's sort of partly become possible because of spending enough time in these places that um you get to know people and they trust you enough you know yeah, but it, yeah it sort of, um, uh, it, it really varies though because some some bits of some bits of the um of asia anyway it, it's not really that you need particularly to have connections you just need to know where the places are you know yeah so um you know you can you can go to this as long as you know where the places are in a lot of in a lot of the more central asian parts it's actually quite a lot easier because it's it's really the tropics where it's more tricky because there's no reason to have seeds in the tropics other yeah. than to grow sensimila you know it's not like their food or something like in nepal some of the land race types anyway are, are, as much as anything are cultivated for the seeds, you know? Yeah. So there are some areas where, and, and the same actually is kind of true in, in even in um, uh, the Hindu Kush, you know, is the seeds are a winter food source as well. So you could, oh, no yeah, yeah, yeah. People, this is a really overlooked uh, thing actually, like even amongst the yeah. experts, people seem to realize that cannabis is a multi-purpose crop in all of the northern areas like including Afghanistan and the Hindu Kush. The only bit where it's not a multi-purpose crop is in the tropical areas where, where is ganja, which is since to me, the semi sensi whatever you want to call it. Yeah. That's the only bit where it's a single purpose crop. It is only grown for producing the buds, you know? I guess um, that makes where, sense too with the hash, with the hash production and stuff, because they could still collect the hash and harvest the seeds. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, sometimes it like, um, I've read people like David Watson, Sam Skunkman saying, yeah. you know, oh, we tried really hard to um, persuade the Afghans to like grow the crop as Sinsamila and like they just mm -hmm. actually just weren't interested. And there's a pretty good reason for that, which is that actually the seeds are in a very important winter food source. They're very high in, you know, in fats. important fats yeah. and proteins as well. And, and in, particularly in the mountains, that's really necessary because obviously you can't keep like huge herds of animals very easily in in the mountains you can have a few cows and goats and stuff but it's not like um there's a there's a there's a huge demand for land and water and everything in in the, in, in, in any mountain area and uh, so you know if you can have that extra source of protein and fats it's it's pretty essential actually you know i would especially think like some of the mid eastern places would be super hard to uh, make those connections especially nowadays um i remember hearing even neville's story back with um i think clive i think that's what he goes by um when they went to i think it was afghanistan and one of them od'd <laughs> in a hut and they were you know trying to kick in their door and whatnot that was that's how the story went anyways so I can only imagine how crazy it is to try to get inroads in there nowadays with the political climate. Um, I mean, one thing one thing I'd pick up on first is just in terms of thinking about the geography of cannabis. Um, Afghanistan, I think, if you if you want to have a kind of 
clear uh, or just because I think it's really helpful, you know, with, with everything is like context is everything. And, and for cannabis, it's really good to get the geographical and cultural context kind of on a basic kind of map in your mind, as it were. And sure. I would say Afghanistan is best thought of as like Southern Central Asia. So Central Asia rather than the Middle East is how I would okay. talk about it in this terms because it's, um, that's the really central, you know, in what we call indicas in the sort of loose sense, colloquial sense, yeah. are a central Asian domesticate basically. And, and uh, so Afghanistan is really sort of the Southern edge of central Asia. And um, rather than the Middle East, I think if you, is it is Middle East is slightly more sort of confusing. It is kind of a confusing term, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause you know, it connects, Afghanistan really sort of connects in a cannabis sense with Xinjiang and places like that, which is Eastern Central Asia. Yeah. Bukhara is sort of really, you know, Central Central Asia as it were. And, and those are all historically very connected, important cannabis centers in terms of the sort of Indica type yeah. uh, races. Um, but yeah, going to those places. Um, yeah. I mean, it's been, it's been increasingly difficult. Um, especially with the uh, Taliban being allowed to kind of yeah. retake the entire place and stuff. But um, yeah, and you know, there is also, yeah, the fact that other, it's definitely one thing I found going to those bits of the world is that the, the culture of kind of opium and stuff does um, mix with the cannabis culture quite a lot. Yeah. And, I definitely met characters who were having problems with things like, you know, harder substances like heroin oh, right. and things. Yeah. But, um, the, yeah, I mean, it's, but there's, there's various ways to do these things. I mean, some of the people who were helping us for a while were, 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 were stringers for, for media, um, and journalism. In fact, all of the people I know who, Sort of from these places who were, 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 were working as stringers and uh, which means sort of helping um, you know j journalists and media companies who, who want to make productions in those areas to, to meet the people find the right places to, doing that oh, kind of job and then they would um, just have a sideline in, in like helping collect seeds for us basically you know and then obviously once the once the um, the the um, Biden sort of pulled the plug on air support for and tech support and everything yeah. for the Afghan army and it just got overrun and most of them had to then um, spend the next sort of you know half a year in like safe houses trying not to get executed. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, it's not great. It gives you a different perspective on these things because everyone's sort of like I mean because like you know. I, when I get, detour too far into politics but I, I sort of thought the whole that whole um post 9 11 adventure was just completely misguided but it's like once they've actually committed to it to then just suddenly fucking turn around and say actually you know what fuck that we're just going to leave and not even tell you yeah was yeah just a just an ex astonishing fucking betrayal but everyone yeah. was expecting it so it's america um, man. that's what they do <laughs> It's yeah, awful, it's it, it is between extremes. There's no sort of it just seems to be incapable of finding a kind of sensible middle ground on foreign policy. To instance, yeah, always yeah. going one way or the other too far. It's like, oh, we don't want nothing to do with it. Oh, we're all in. Oh, we want nothing to do with it. Oh, we're all in. It's like, Jesus, man, just fucking, you know, it's just this insane mechanism that seems to fucking infect all the thinking about it. But, Leaving all the caches <laughs> of weapons and whatnot too, just to find their their homes to wherever yeah if i can do something with ukraine the way it's going so yeah it's just yeah. gift them the entire fucking um anyway but yeah um it's 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 um but yeah so yeah i mean that's that's mostly what i've seen of it is the the post 9 11 kind of version of the hippie trail so it is quite hard to avoid the political aspects of it because it absolutely the landscape so transformed by the time I got to see most of it, like it, you know, the context in which I saw people smoking a lot were like 
um, security guards and sort of, yeah, you know, sort of those kind of characters like sitting around like with like, you know, guns and stuff outside places like embassies and hotels and whatever, uh, you know, very publicly smoking hash and things. It's like there's sort of, there's a whole um, martial kind of militant, not mil militant, you know, um, warfare type context of cannabis use there and things that I start to realize, yeah, it's not just a sort of um, the, the hippie trail stereotypes of sort of spiritual use and things are actually just one side of the, the culture of cannabis. There's whole ranges of, of ways it's used traditionally that aren't necessarily part of the main Western discourse of like oriental cannabis culture, you know? Yeah, um, see, that's, that's yeah. part of the story that fascinates me because it's, it's a lot of the stuff that even as deep into cannabis history and stuff as I am, that's like not something I'm really super familiar with. So I don't speak on it. You know, I don't know it. But you're the type of person that I can speak to that has a lot more insight into that. And I think uh, the more people are able to see all these different perspectives, um, different ways of thinking about how it's been used, maybe ways they've never even considered, you know, I think that's really important to talk about. Yeah, I think it's like, I think everyone, you know, we all kind of want to uh, kind of know what the roots of the plant are and where it's come from and things. Um, but there's definitely been a tendency in in sort of the right on in in a lot of the writing about it to to favour this idea that it's um, uh, to to favour aspects of it that fitted with the sort of historical moment of the '60s when it really became a mass phenomenon in the West, you know, which was yeah mostly sort of the anti-war, anti-racist, um, and anti sort of countercultural. Uh, aspects that were emphasized all those things like you know the assassins and stuff did kind of creep in there because that was already talked about quite a lot in yeah. sort of orientalist myths of or, or legends or whatever so you know that and that does go into the martial context of use and stuff as well um, one one thing i thought we should go over early on too because yeah. uh i mean the nomenclature is important and and even even this far in, like, I don't feel confident anymore, like trying to say what I think a land race is versus an heirloom versus, you know, anything else. Um, I'd love right. to have your, your actual working definitions of some of these things as we talk about it. So people understand what we're talking about when we say land race and heirloom varieties. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always a good idea. Yeah, it's just yeah. Complete fucking minefield of like different terms that uh, so so i mean la land race is just a really unfortunate word from my perspective that was a translation that was made in the sort of late 19th early late 19th century from various european languages into english from german terms danish terms whatever like land in german it would be landrasse that was translated yeah. into english as land race um whereas actually if you were to do that translation these days land race would be best translated as country breed or something like that oh, so it's yeah so it's a defunct form of the word race that we just don't use anymore it's completely archaic now in english yeah. but it, it was it, it, it race did once in english have the meaning of breed as in that created something that someone has bred has created like a crop or a a breed of animal you know sure. so 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 land races are uh artificially selected they're creations by humans for products that we want they're created in certain areas by farmers so they, they have a an element of region being region specific and, and cultures but they're culture specific and they're absolutely creatures of human desire and whatever so they're they're things that farmers have created for certain products so all land races are product specific. So the um, tropical land races are, are specific for, and we're talking drug quote, you know, air quotes, drug cannabis yeah. here. So tropical land races from places like India, Southeast Asia are all specifically for uh, sensamila slash semi-sensi as in ganja is the traditional term for this. Like it's the seedless inflorescence is or, or you know very lightly seeded yeah uh, it should be like that and then that product goes back to 
at least the 15th century, perhaps as early as the 12th century in India, you can find Sanskrit literature that describes that technique of roguing out the males, cutting down the males, how to maximize resin production by certain cultivation techniques and so on. So, Jesus. so what we call sativas are, you know, th those are what we call sativas. So the tropical land races, narrow leafleted, yeah. um, high THC, because they've got this uh, long history of individual plant selection that's enabled by keeping the seed from a batch of good ganja, you know, because yeah. in practice, uh, farmers don't, you, know, you, you can find uh, genuinely 100% sinsamila. It is still around even these days in, in places like India and Laos and Thailand and stuff. But for the most part, you, you if you buy a, a, a batch of any significant size of ganja, you will find one or two seeds in there. If you're in, in, in India, you know, it it's, can be loads of seeds often, sure. you know. But um, it shouldn't be like that. And historically, it wasn't like that for the most part, you know. It's um, amazing. But, but it goes back that far. I didn't know that. Then it went back to the 1200s yeah. with uh, selections. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, with with um, cutting down, um, yeah, and you know, so the, the the point the point is that individual plant selection is a is a strong selective pressure, and that is enabled by that strong selective pressure is enabled by the fact that you do often find a, a seed or two in a batch of ganja that you would buy. You know, absolutely. So consumers and aficionados and farmers are all able to do that. So consciously or unconsciously, you've got at least 500 years of individual plant selection being a factor in the creation of sativas, which is why, as any kind of aficionado knows, they are the strongest forms of land races, Thai, Lao, Burmese, South Indian, like Kerala, uh, all these types of plants are what went in to form the real kind of original haze yeah. type sativas that people know in the states and you know back in the late 60s early 70s this was literally fetching multiples its weight in gold in terms of price by the time it got from from thailand to the west coast of the united states and it was the same in in england so if you look at the customs seizures records from the early 70s for, for, for cannabis that was coming from places like Isan in Thailand. It was like they were, it was testing, you know, with thin layer chromatography, but which is not hugely accurate, but it was testing kind of 17% THC. Yeah. And that's when not gaming the tests. And it's probably sat in a warehouse in <laughs> London or right. for months, never mind how long it took to get to England in the first place, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we're talking high levels of potency. So people aren't making it up when they say that this stuff could blow your head off, you know, yeah, even back sure. in the 60s and 70s. And to be honest, it doesn't, you don't need much more than 10% THC anyway. A lot of it's about the uh, other stuff that's in this, in these, uh, the other phytochemicals that are in these plants. Absolutely. So anyway, to, to stay focused. So there's this, those are the sativas. And then the, in the north, the main group is what people call colloquially indicas which uh the you know i guess everyone knows what i'm talking about broadly speaking but that, that again this is a type of land race that um you know with the more semi-dwarf morphology used for making hash so product specific there's no culture of sinsamila in north of 30 degrees latitude so once you've got to the north of Pakistan, there just is no, but it's, in, fact, in fact, once you've even got to the Punjab in India or the Punjab in Pakistan, it's bisected by colonialism. The, um, once you've got there, there's no culture of Sinsamila by the time you even get to the Punjab. Once you've gone north of the Punjab towards the foothills of the Hindu Kush, absolutely no Sinsamila culture at all. It's all hash and uh, it's always been that way. So when you make hash, you pull the seeds yeah. in the process of making the hash. So there just is not ever been, been much in the way of an, any individual plant selection on hash land races. So mm -hmm. they're a bulk selected crop. 
that probably goes back millennia perhaps mm-hmm. um that bulk selection which is why on balance the the um the the cannabinoid um uh characteristics of of, of, of indica land races do we sort of lean slightly towards thc dominant um plants like type one plants as people will call yeah. it but you do have in the population a mix of type one type two type three uh, so, you know, high ratio of THC to CBD is type 1, balanced THC and CBD is type 2, and then type 3 is sort of higher ratio of CBD to THC. So most hash land races yeah. will typically, if they're a pure land race, we're talking not a, you know, not Afghani number 1 or something you can buy yeah. off a Dutch um, seed bank. Um, if they're a real land race, they tend to be like that. They do lean slightly towards type 1 because they've had that history of bulk selection it's you know more than random more than random lean towards type one but um uh yeah if, if you want to grow a crop of sensimilla from from seed it's not much use uh to to, to use a a real land race you know they need to be worked to to make them a sensimilla cultivar you know so if yeah. you were talking about the difference between an heirloom and a land race. Heirloom is not a technical term as far as I know, but it, I would define it in the context of cannabis as uh, a, a land race that's been worked specifically for in, in, a, in a Western or modern context for Cincinnati. So X18 or Deep Chunk or Afghani number one, they're all in indica, indica heirlooms in the sense they're an indica land race that's been worked for making Cincinnati. You know? Yeah. That's how I would define that it. That makes sense. Yeah. It, yeah, uh, what, and then you've got what, one other what are the barrel really... varieties. Then, like, how how would you define those in, in in terms of like land race heirloom? Is it its own type? Mm. So, um, feral or kind of wild type is another term you could use that I think is quite good. Um, there. Um, uh, you you don't find them much in the tropics. That as as a, as a rule, cannabis doesn't naturalize uh, very well in the tropics. It's not uh, a species that is well adapted to that type of climate. So if you do find if you do find feral um, cannabis in the tropics, it's because you're 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 at altitude somewhere with a fairly temperate climate. Um, so for the most part, if you if you're in, for example, India, you might find weedy uh, cannabis growing like anywhere sort of north of the Ganges. So we're talking between in, in in the sort of top half of North India between the Ganges and the Himalayas, you know. Okay. And then as you go up towards the Himalayas, suddenly you'll find areas where it just grows fucking everywhere, you know, <laughs> like feral, just seas of feral stuff. Especially if you go up into Pakistan, like Punjab, fucking everywhere. Um, uh, and then up into the mountains around the rivers and places, it, 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 anywhere where there's kind of disturbed land. But it's basically, uh, as a species, it's uh, it's a step species, meaning it, it likes kind of windy, um, fairly dry places where there's lots of disturbed land, and it, it, uh, so it likes to grow along the sides of rivers where animals come to drink and shit and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it likes high nitrogen, uh, lo- decent amounts of water, but not rainy. You know. Um, Does anyway, it tend to it, lean CBD dominant for stuff like that? Um, no, um, not necessarily. So um, basically, they're kind of um, like nobody knows where there's a pure. Nobody's ever kind of satisfactorily identified like a pure wild, like unaffected by humans, pure wild cannabis plants has never been found. You know, that makes sense. So what you actually have is like parallel populations that have just been swapping genes with whatever the local form of cannabis is. You know, mm-hmm. in a sense of like humans domesticated it at least, I don't know, kind of say eight thousand years ago. Probably we started at least. You know unintentionally domesticating cannabis yeah. and um, by just bringing it back to hunter gatherers, like bringing it back to places and where they were eating and stuff. We're like, we're unconsciously selecting for types that we 
liked, you know? Yeah. And then they were quite happy to grow around our campfires and stuff because there was lots of shit and discarded animal bones and stuff that just are good for cannabis. Yeah. To so um, um, basically, if you're in somewhere like the Punjab where it grows, uh, which is sort of north uh, west India, where 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 there's a lot of wild grown cannabis, you can you can people do like crop the feral uh, weedy stuff, provided it's somewhere clean that's not dusty and things. You can just crop that and um, use it for making food and things. You know. Yeah. So these are high, high THC um, in in the sense of uh, they will get you stoned. You know, it's it, yeah. It, it's not like in um, places like I don't know Wisconsin or somewhere in the states <laughs> where it's yeah. it's basically hemp that's gone feral. You know. Yeah, the fiber um, hemp varieties. <laughs> yeah, I mean these are definitely like if we're talking, uh, I'll probably make things confusing. But anyway, these are like. In 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 those in all of sort of central and south South Asia where you get feral populations, it's pretty much um, drug drug type quotes yeah. cannabis, yeah. And then in the Himalayas, like uh, people do sometimes hand rub the the feral populations for for charis, and mm -hmm. it makes what people sometimes call jungly charis, as in like wild charis, but. Actually, there's a again. This is one of those kind of hippie trail type confusions. There's been this assumption that Himalayan cannabis is always feral cannabis, which is it, which it isn't. Like, yeah, ninety nine percent of the charis that's produced in the Himalayas every year is from domesticated, intentionally cultivated land races grown in fields by a farmer. You know, yeah, this notion that it's the Himalayan cannabis is uh, is all wild and stuff is not not accurate. Like in, in terms of the product, is this very seldom produced from the, the wild weedy stands. You can and people do, but it's got way less resin production than the, the, the than the actual land races do. You know. I'm sure. Yeah, and 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 it's useless for making uh, sinsamilo. It's not because it's all going to be seeded anyway. Yeah. You, you can't use it for to smoke as bud. It's just it's. I mean, you do see sadhus doing that. I have seen sadhus, like uh, yogis, wandering kind of yogi characters who've yeah. gone up to the Himalayas and picked picked a whole load of uh, feral flowers, and then they just sit and they kind of pick out the seeds and mix it with some tobacco and smoke it. But it's it's not like it's uh, you know it's not um, designed for that. Yeah, just why people can rub it for charis because it. it it's time consuming to do, but you end up with a product that is actually going to get you stoned. Yeah. Whereas uh, smoking a whole load of feral bud like that mixed with tobacco, it's more just like a kind of uh, maybe take the edge off it, whatever physical discomfort you experience as a, as a wandering yogi, but it's not going to like get you particularly high. I wouldn't have thought unless you've really just happened to find an unusually strong plant. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, one of the, the interesting things like from from the american perspective at least for mine um is trying like in my mind to define expressions between uh when people talk about indica types specifically or the the broadleaf types um the differences between like an afghani type plant and a pakistani plant where the the overlap is and you know like there's always talk of Chinese um, broadleaf types. And I, I've never got my hands on any of those. I remember someone made the Yunnan available for a while, but I never got to grow any. Um, I'd like to hear some of your insight on that and the, the major differences. And I know it's, it's kind of hard to generally speak on expressions from whole regions, you know, depending on the elevation. But is there anything that you've noticed between, um, say, Afghanistan and Pakistan in, in how they grow? um scent expressions anything like that it, i mean it's it's particularly difficult with um those northern type central asian you know afghan pakistani yeah uh, uh populations because what you get if you grow like a first generation of direct from those places like seeds directly from a farmer in pakistan or afghanistan whatever 
there's a huge amount of variation within the population of one batch of seeds from one farmer. So the range of aromas that you're going to find in one field from plant to plant, just in one of those land races, is extraordinarily diverse. You know, one plant might be really kind of like kind of candy shop, sweet, mm -hmm. tangy aromas. The next one might smell like a dog shit, you know, yeah. or whatever. And, and, and so it's particularly in those northern populations, there's because they're bulk selected, they're not as genetically narrow as tropical sativa yeah. populations are. So because they, they haven't had, they haven't, you know, the, the genome hasn't been stepped on by farmers doing much in the way of very consciously, intentionally directed breeding. There's a, a huge amount of variation anyway. And then yeah. I, on top of that, in terms of the difficulty of generalizing you know, because the, the assumption amongst aficionados is that precision, more precision in in your description means more accuracy. But actually, if you get if you get too precise on these things, you become less accurate. You know. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Because there's vast amounts of diversity. So, particularly with cannabis, because it's so phenotypically plastic. So it because yeah. like I was saying, it's a mountain. Uh, species that's evolved um, at altitude um, to adapt to the huge climate shifts you get at altitude and that kind of thing, it can express itself very differently depending on where it's planted. So if you were to plant the same land race at sea level and then plant it at three and a half thousand meters, exactly the same batch of seeds from the same farmer uh, you will see very different plant looking plants morphologically because you plant them up higher altitude they're going to grow much shorter broad more broadly to, they're going to pump out way more resin yeah probably going to have different phytochemicals it's probably smell different and everything you know so yeah and likewise if you you can get that even with uh, tropical sativas if you grow them on well they're going to be amazing if you grow them incompetently they're not going to smell so good you know yeah, um, it, it, and, it, you kind of um, have to go to point of origin to to experience them as they are. Yeah, which uh, is yeah. I mean, it definitely makes a vast difference, even with the more genetically narrow populations like tropical sativas. If they're grown well by yeah. someone who knows how to do it on the right type of land with the right irrigation timing, the right feeding timing, the right uh, you know everything if you overwater a tropical sativa late in flower it's going to keep growing keep putting out buds and leaflets and it's going to be shit yeah and, and no one and this is why you get all this bollocks talk about 30 week sativas indoors and stuff it's just people just <laughs> yeah. keep on fucking watering it you know <laughs> so stop I've had feeding that experience. It. <laughs> but anyway you know and, and if you look at the historical records it's always it will tell you this like uh, in the um 19th century documentation of, of the ganja farms in uh, bengal and places it's like yeah the farmers mm -hmm. always say the worst thing that can happen is we get rains in like january february and it'll fuck up our whole crop because it will start shooting again yada oh, yada yada yeah anyway so it's all it's all there if, if, if you if you want to look and stuff and i have blogged about this on the on the site as well if people are wanting to go into more depth and you can find all the sources and stuff but um, it's an uh, amazing blog, by the way. Like it's, <laughs> I've learned a lot <laughs> reading through it over the years. Oh, that's good to know. I I just got some got someone reads it. <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's it's how I how I um, like came to know you without speaking to you a bunch was through the blog right, right. And, and seeing the passion and how you write and how in depth the detail was and and over time learning how accurate it was, which is the most important, you know. Yeah. Well, it's good to hear, man. Thanks. I, I appreciate it. I, I've shifted most of it now to the actual main website blog rather than the sort of um, independent blog because uh, it just seems to make more sense. So generally, yeah. I've been kind of moving everything over to the main blog on the site now just because uh, it seems to make more sense. But I, 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 before I lose the thread of what you were originally asking, um, so in terms of Pakistan versus Afghanistan, so the thing to bear in mind is like... Um, Seeds move around a lot. Seeds move around with people as in areas where people use them as 
as a food and not just for growing as well. Yeah. Plus, um, uh, you know, these are artificial political boundaries. So there's no cultural real boundary if in, 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 in meaningful terms, cannabis wise between uh, the Hindu Kush in Pakistan and the Hindu Kush in Afghanistan, you know? Yeah. So I, I want to try to kind of avoid being sort of bitchy as far as possible, but there's all this stuff I see on Instagram with people talking about Durand line and stuff. And yeah. like the Durand line is this, it's just this fucking bizarre to me as well, because I think most of the kids who are doing this are like Asian as well. So it's like the Durand line was just, Durand was just some cunt from the UK who drew a pencil line across the boundary between Pakistan and Afghanistan, you know? Yeah. The fuck has that yeah. got to do with anything, you know? Yeah, and, really and, and and it, it, it's only in the last kind of 10 years that um, uh, they've actually really started policing that border and putting fences up and things. And even then, it doesn't make the blindest fucking bit of difference. Anyone who really yeah. wants to get things across it can still do it. Sure. But it, in cannabis terms, it's just fucking meaningless. I mean... And, and and seeds have been, you know, uh, seeds have been moved from Afghanistan down to places like Tira Valley in Pakistan. You know, there's there's plenty of local stories about the various kind of dervish, like Kalanda Sufi type saint characters who are sort of credited with bringing seeds into Tira and things, and 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 um, which Tira is one of the big cultivation valleys in Pakistan. And, and yeah, this this whole area is, is seamless seamless with this, the whole reason the politics and the history is the way it is is because it's uh, impossible to police these mountain borders you know oh i'm sure uh, there's huge smuggling between these places and then uh Chitral is another one of the famous uh, areas like yakun and uh, valley and things up in the hindu kush these all lead into xinjiang these are the trade routes that you would take from xinjiang which is the eastern central asian area this turkic area of of uh, politically it's inside what's now China. And this was a, the biggest hash producing uh, region in, in the world for, oh, wow. for centuries. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was the epicenter of hash production. So it wasn't Afghanistan or Pakistan. It was Xinjiang was until the 19, late 1930s was the absolute fucking epicenter of world hash production. I mean, thousands and thousands of tons of hash were being moved from these places across the mountain passes into the into India because all the money was in northern India, yeah. and, and the demand for these products was in northern India and these huge cities, which even in the late nineteenth century, places like Lahore and Delhi had millions of what well, Lahore certainly had, in, which is the big Punjabi city, had you know seven, eight, nine, ten million people or whatever, even in the eighteen sixties. Yeah. Yeah. So these were massively massive centers of demand for these products, and so they. The, the production was all happening in Eastern Central Asia, so in Xinjiang, and um, you know the British were trying to make sure as much of what came into India was being taxed effectively. They didn't want too much smuggling, and um, you know seeds were moving around between these places. You can read about the people who were responsible for uh, a lot of the uh, initiation of like commercial production in in. Um, in Xinjiang for India were often Indians or uh, uh, ethnically eth from ethnic groups of, of the mountains of Pakistan, you know, so there, there's just not um, um, much basis for assuming that there's going to be a, you know, there's a, there's a very nuanced picture if you're talking about the diff how, how these land races in these regions are differentiated from each other. Yeah. Once you get into Pakistan in the northern mountains, there probably is a certain degree of mixing between kind of the more sativa type. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the further south you move away from the southern edges of Central Asia, the further south you get away from the Hindu Kush, there probably is more, there is a, a higher likelihood that you're going to have a degree of intermixing with more monsoony type, tropical type. Punjabi type populations, uh, so you know more hybridization between sativa type populations and indica type populations. Sure. The further north you go into, uh, I don't know, into places like Xinjiang, there's a higher likelihood, I guess, of it being a, a sort of quotes pure indica type. You know, so if you look at the plants that were brought back from Xinjiang in the 
early 20th century by people like Frank Meyer and stuff for the USDA. They definitely mm -hmm. are very indica looking um, plants. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know. Um, you have some of those pictures on your blog too, correct? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and, and um, uh, you know, they're, mm, there's no question that there are these distinct types you know the confusion of the confusion with the discussion about are there such things as indicas and sativas is like yes there definitely are in terms of if you're looking at pure land races yeah real land races um there are these clearly distinct types there's also of course some integrating between them even in pure land races some yeah. some land races are likely to have arisen through mixing of these types uh, but of course, once you move into the context of what you're going to find at most dispensaries or seed banks, uh, like cannabis internet seed banks, that is, yeah, most of what you're going to find is, is a indicative sativa hybrid. So this yeah. terminology becomes meaningless in, in often most of the time in those contexts, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, and then the important point too, like, especially, uh, from people that in, in the US that can go to collectives and stuff and they're seeing indica hybrid sativa and they feel like they have a pretty good working knowledge of what what each is and um, quite often I mean I don't really see anything too narrow leaf yeah. anywhere you know or no yeah, not at all it's a, it's a problem because um, um, that's how cannabis goes extinct you know yeah. Biodiversity in cannabis primarily disappears through hybridization. You know? Yeah. So uh, this impulse that most people have to like hybridize everything when they, because it is fun, you know, to so, like see what happens. Oh, sure. Yeah. It, actually, the most exciting thing you can do really these days, especially, is to actually keep some pristine lines going that you haven't outcrossed, because that's the basis of uh, everything really. And once people got to a point where all we've got are hybridized lines then it becomes impossible to to do breeding well, it doesn't become impossible but you can't make true f1 cultivars and stuff. Yeah. want more syndicate check out our patreon in the description below thank you for joining us on this journey we are forever thankful that enough people watch us to keep us going with that in mind you can show your support for the show by liking subscribing and sharing the show we don't advertise, so we need you. Also, hit riotseeds.com and syndicategear.com to show more support for the show. Kick over the statues and bring it back to the farmers. <laughs>